Hi, welcome to the show. Today I'm in Cambridge and I'm talking to Rob Fox. Hi there. Would you tell us a bit about what you do? Hello there guys, thank you James for having me on here today. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about Active Childhood. Active Childhood was set up in the summer of uh, 2016 and is an active Facebook group that is <laughs> engages uh, conversation on a number of key aspects of the early years curriculum. But we, we kind of Often in practice we have um, those questions, those ideas that we're not really, that we feel we're alone in our own practices, our own feelings and things. This forum I set up um, as a basis and sort of a uh, network of, dis uh, to bring about a network of discussion to challenge best practice, challenge perspectives and help enhance our own professional outlook on the way the early years is going. I think what's been really interesting since I joined the forum is seeing kind of that wider aspect of the early years education you know, not just looking at it from a kind of UK let's see what's in development matters but actually looking at those wider aspects of other practitioners and other studies and teachings from abroad and there's quite a few people from abroad in the forums as well. Yeah absolutely I think also we get so hung up on the early years foundation stage in particular being a very much tick box, tick box exercise as such you know we need to have children meeting baseline assessments by the age of two they need to be doing this by the age of three they need to be doing this by the age of four they need to be you know meeting criteria that is not developmentally appropriate for their age but yet we're given the expectations that that's the way they need to be with the group in particular it allows us to challenge perspectives of the way curricula should be more shaped towards children's own development and their individual learning pathways and giving children the ultimate respect as a unique educator a unique learner in the workplace and in their workspace in the classroom i think we were talking a lot about how i think under the pressure of things and don't get me wrong you know development matters has been an absolutely wonderful document but i think it can become kind of like, like you said the tick box for people and feel like oh my child's behind because they're 29 months and next month they need to do this whereas looking at the wider aspect of the early education can really help support looking at that child as an individual and unique child we were talking about uh, classroom setups and things like that as well weren't we and yeah absolutely and I think too often in practice we're geared towards you know my child needs to be potty trained by the age of three and a half they need to be potty trained by the age of two they need to be you know supported in different aspects of their learning but it's always the next step it's always a jump and actually as practitioners as practitioners professionals in this industry we're not challenging and reflecting on our own learning environments and that was the main kind of idea for my forum to be able to challenge these ideas build up a shared understanding of we need to focus and become in tune to what children are children's interests are but they're also what's more important their individual needs and supporting these children and actually recognizing their learning styles recognizing it what they are and too much with our approach in especially in the early years foundation stage we're guiding children continuously to the next thing we're making them conformists so maybe that's maybe that's a controversial term to say but we are <laughs> we are uh, we are making children conformist to the same approach we're making sure that you know we're observing children in a particular way to make sure they're jumping through hoops or guiding themselves on an obstacle course so where am i heading where why am i why am i talking about this in particularly children children's learning needs to be unique to them how do we do this? Well, we look at our environments, we look how critical our environments are, and are children being given the ownership of their own space? Are they, are they managing their own space? Are they 
do they plan the space with you or are you as a teacher oh yes because we've got all the ideas as teachers are you the ones embedding your own personal thoughts that you've done year in year out to make it the easy option i'm not going to mention any any corporate people but you know are we doing the sparkle approach but I think I think that's key as well because when the workload and the pressure's on it can be so tempting to go I just you know it's taken me so long to do the planning I then need to prepare the resources oh, I've got a learning walk next week I've got this and we can kind of forget about that child and go for I know where I can download a load of laminated resources that we can stick up and that will make that wall look great and that will tick my diversity box and it will all be fine I think, I think too often t these days, every single environment should reflect the aesthetics of the children that you have within your, set within your classroom in particular. And often I think diversity is, um, diversity is a term that people are becoming tokenistic. You know, the amount of times I've walked into settings of recent and people have got pictures of the Leaning Tower of Pisa or the Taj Mahal when they don't have children of Italian or orientation or origin or from India. What is the point? Oh yes, we're promoting global outlook on the world. We're looking at understanding of the world. We're introducing children to individual cultures. Do, but does that really it's not it's just, the it's just pictures on the wall? It's, it's a it's, picture on a wall. Yeah. Another term I get from this is the idea of um, the same approach, the same approach being used in classrooms throughout the country and actually we need to recognise our children for who they are, their learning styles, their learning values but also like their family upbringing, that can bring in, communicating with home life can make your environment more inclusive. This sounds basic but yet we're guided by time, we're guided by baselines and these opportunities get missed out. Where I'm going is, I get parents to come into my setting, I get, you know, I provide, um, in the first term we provide uh, learning boxes that their uh, are sent home and parents are able to bring in cultural resources based on their country. Just That's to have yeah. a bit of home and that is how you take the diversity approach. I do think you have, you know, children at the beginning of the year, you know, they can be part of that transition and orientation of the room. It's both building up relationships with yourself, but orientating them around the room, you know, having pictures of their family up, yeah. things like that can really help. I know I've done something similar with uh, a big world map, yeah. and then we asked the children to send in pictures of where some of their grandparents lived before, yeah. and they've sent in little pictures from Poland, and we've had it on the map, and it's just been a lovely talking point, and it's evolved over the first over few time. weeks, and it's yeah. something that they can talk about. About. And if I said to that child, what, what's up here? They can actually tell me. It's not just a picture printed from a website. And also, it's how practical is this learning? How engaging? What, what are the learning outcomes of what we're delivering? Of recent, I am, in practice, I've seen um, a dialogue between one of the grandparents who lives in New Zealand. She, she sends um, postcards to the class every couple of weeks and they have this ongoing dialogue with her. They send her a thing back, she sends them stuff back. So, you know, and actually she came to visit the children and when she was in the UK and they knew who she was. So it's uh, engaging with families, talking about their ideas. Fortunate English is her first language and obviously there could be some difficulties with language barriers and things but making a start of looking at recognizing the child for who they are and the environments for what they have and utilizing the environment as a teaching tool and i'm sure if you reach out to some of the families in your class you know probably by the time you get to a grandparent there'd be someone who lives somewhere who would be able to share something with the class maybe that could be something brought in where they could be a visitor after you do a bit of work yeah. building up to it the um, writing for a purpose there you know asking questions yeah. investigating and sharing that and also that's really developing that child's confidence and being able to come in and share something so I've got something to share with you today and something to show the class absolutely James and it's engaging engaging learning from a practical sense of view and absolutely making 
making the learning as practical and as active as possible because there is more learning outcomes in what we've just discussed than having a child sat down at a table forcefully and said you need to write this, you need to be a rote learner, you need to be doing your ABCs, you need to be doing that. But if it's practical and relatable to them, then they have an interest. Maybe this term we need to start looking back, I know we are constantly reflecting on our practice but not enough of us do. It's time. Maybe you take you need to take that step back and actually think about what's happening and allow some time for reflection on things that are happening within your own learning Definitely. environment. I think we were talking, we've even been putting the world to rights today about yeah. everything early years, so yeah. uh, if it doesn't make the cut, that'll yeah. be for another video. That's... But I think one of the things I was talking about was sometimes, you know, good is just good enough. And don't get me wrong, as a good practitioner, Love me drilling going on over there. As a good <laughs> practitioner, sometimes what happens is that you always feel that when a child brings you something, you have to go, what's that next step? What's that next thing that I can get from them? And sometimes, you know what? Good is good enough. Sometimes, imagine every time you went up to a grown up and every time you spoke to someone, there was always one more thing they want from you. One more thing every yeah. time. It would become quite draining, wouldn't it? This idea Absolutely. of having to please the adult all the time, you know. I think, you know, that's something I'm, I'm deeply thinking about now. Don't get me wrong. You know, I want to forward their learning, but sometimes, sometimes I think I can always be like, oh, how can I extend this learning even further right now in this space? Whereas actually sometimes to sit back and reflect on that and think, how can I take that further at a later date? Also, how can I reflect on the whole, whole group dynamic? I, I also think it's when you're in terms of dealing with reflection, it's not about you, also it's about in, enabling children to be reflective learners of their own learning. And obviously, we as educators, we think we need to be the ones to program children into the next step of learning. We need to be asking them too many questions. But actually, if we become attuned to them, if we listen to what they have to say, then our practice develops so much more. We, you know, examples of practical solutions to that is allowing circle times to happen, but allowing them time. Not having long periods of time where children are sat still, but having reflective meetings in the morning to plan what they're going to do. Give this five, ten, five, ten minutes, or don't put a time limit on it. If they're engaged in the dialogue, then let it flow. Don't be, I think too often, we've, we've been discussing this today about routine, I think we're very much geared towards routine and the way we write observations and the way our outcomes should look for children especially. Um, we were talking about, um, for example, you know, especially when things like moderation come up, and I know everyone's got kind of their, their learning journals or however you evidence your work, digitally or not, yeah. it, can, it can feel a pressure to go, oh, I've not got enough in this child's book. And I know that, you know, it's more a conversation piece, and I've talked previously in other videos about case studies and things like that that you can do, but you do feel a slight pressure, well, I do anyway, to make sure that they've got enough in their book. And every time I'm stood there kind of writing up a note or writing up an observation or trying to do something, it starts to become this tick list, you know. Yeah. And and I've got, got people doing um, physical development, we're looking for that, okay, so let's do the obstacle course. Yeah, the generic <laughs> obstacle course or the observation on the of the child on the bike, as such. And actually... It's just a photo. It's just uh, a it photo. Can, but but you've written anything. underneath it, oh, that they've uh, navigated around the cones and yeah. navigated the space and kept their head up, you know, but is there really any point? I think we need to really think about our key time and looking at, it should just be significant observations and that should be acceptable throughout. But also, there is so many different ways of writing observation, James, we were discussing this earlier, and making sure that they are appropriate, they are relatable to the child, and the next step, or, you know, don't be hung up on the next step as well. Allowing opportunities to evolve over time and actually think, you know, a period of six weeks, if my child hasn't met that, okay, it's okay. It's okay, but too long we've got pressures on, we must meet this baseline assessment, we must meet this criteria, but actually, let the child be. Eventually they will get there. We know this, you know this, James and I know this, but it's, it's not being utilized in practice enough to, to be able to understand that we give time for children, we acknowledge them for who they are. And, and I think if we can look at, um, Using less time to kind of do these big complex plans, yeah. more time to you know listen to the children, really reflect on what their needs are, 
the whole holistic approach yeah. and then from there you can spend more time on resources, more time on interactions. I think sometimes the paperwork can get in the way. Well the paperwork takes over, the, the paperwork certainly takes over and it's it's that balance, it's that balance between being with the children, the, you know, the, I feel like a juggler, especially when, you, you know, you, you have four observations to go for the rest of the week and you need to make sure that that child has been doing the physical activity or, oh wait, they don't have anything in there. Creative, quick, I must do a creative activity with them. Oh, no, sugar, I must, I must, I must put, uh, you know, I must get them to do uh, some sort of narrative and in the role play. But is this relevant? Is this relevant? I, I'm putting that out there. Is this relevant? You know, are we really being attuned to children or are we trying to push them on the next level? When we were looking at this deeply as well, we were looking at the differences with regards to if you're working in kind of a, a private nursery, sometimes it can be a different outlook and it, depending on the management, a different um, look on the education of the children compared to uh, a school nursery or a school reception. Yeah. And I think sometimes there does feel like a bit more of a rounded play approach. Yeah. Some nurses, I know that's generalising, yeah. but it does seem that there still seems to be that slight pressure of we need to get them ready for year one, therefore we need to be more formalised. And it really worries me. It really is really worrying to see the this amount, happen. The, the amount of times I hear, you know, our children need to be school ready. A good early years provision in the reception class they're utilising continuous provision, they're allowing children to take ownership of their own space and time and practitioners are reflective of what they're doing so that the learning is a continuous pathway of you know children's interests taking forward. What, we, what I find is it's hard in some places that you go into where there's not an understanding of theory, there's not an understanding of fear um, Un the theory that underpins the practice and that's why I'm here from an active childhood perspective to share on on that to talk about and question these theorists of practice but also to educate others on you know that the fear, sorry the theory that underpins the practice of why we do the certain things in practice and the benefits because it's all for the children at the end of the day and I think it is, I, I see that from my point of view, coming from year one where I was primary trained, going into that nursery environment. It was, I didn't, I didn't see the learning that was going on. It just looked like organised chaos. Yeah. It looked like children were everywhere and I kind of had that original mindset that, oh, while the children are playing, they're out my hair, while I can get on with a few groups and get some things done. Yeah. And then as my understanding of the early years approach uh, developed, that's when I realised that actually the deeper level learning was going on with the groups that were playing rather than the ones that were sat with me waiting to go, um, can I go now? Can I play now? Have we yeah. finished now? Can I go back to all the really interesting stuff that keeps me engaged? Yeah, but it's that, it's play is serious learning, whatever, um, whatever it may be, but play is serious learning, play is the way forward and actually I think I, having these critical conversations with the parents that you have, I've often had conversations with them where um, I, I've had parents say to me, I want my child sat down at a desk and they need to be engaged and they have no understanding of what play is. Mm -hmm. they, they just see it as, a, oh, they're playing, it's, it's a bit of fun. I had children come to me at uh, reception and year one, kind of, they come in, they've got, um, they write their name in capital letters, but they, they don't know how to share, they don't know how to control their, their anger or their, their emotions. emotions, you know, so those kind of areas where, you know, that rounded approach sometimes gets lost and I think, I'm, I'm a big believer that we need to be push pushing this into year one and year two. I think we're going too formal too early still. We need to have that belief in play and play is not a bad word. It is spoken of in such, it just, it winds me up all the time because I guess <laughs> me the, too. It, it gets to Completely. the point where I'm a practitioner who's told that I need to be teaching and learning through play but when people come into the room they can't see that learning and people can go to default of um, where the children sat yeah. down, who's holding a pencil, who's doing their counting, and it's so much more. Or where are the numbers in your environment? What, how relatable is this? I always question how relatable are the things that we are doing and how a 
appropriate, are they? You know, the, at the moment I'm, I, I do practical phonics with my children because that's what I'm being asked to do. But is it really appropriate to be doing phonics? I throw that open to you, James. <laughs> big questions here. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot to reflect on, a lot to reflect on. You know, it's constant reflection, keeping, keeping your mind open to new ideas, and hopefully we've established some of those points today to help guide forward. Mm -hmm. um, some children do respond well to a more formalised approach, and some, some children excel in that environment, and, but I, I just feel that, um, you know, with regards to, I like a mixture of both some more of the formal sit-down activities yeah. to start getting them used to those activities, but I do feel that year one and two should be much more awe and wonder, much well, more play. Uh, it's, it's funny you say that. I'm very much in my approach to learning. I'm inspired by the words of a hundred languages and Lewis Mugutsi, and he was an educator in Reggio. And I believe that every educator should read the hundred languages. It's inspired my learning. I discovered this um, whilst at university and it kind of opened my outlook and mindset to children's capabilities and how capable children are and their ideas and their theories. Their theories are greater than ours. But yet we feel as educators we need to be giving children ideas continuously. But then what is my job? What is my job? I'm there to observe, I'm there to implement, but I'm also there to listen. And I find that we don't listen to children enough. There is more learning that we can do. We can observe and listen to their ideas, their changing views, because they have many ideas that we may have not even thought about. And actually, is that is that more the learning can evolve naturally or be, t be de termed organic and original? How exciting does that sound? In rela Otherwise, uh, you know, or do we go for the approach of let's have that tick box exercise because it's easier? It's actually easier to become attuned to listening to children than it is to uh, to uh, than to uh, take the faster option. And I think you know there are so many curriculums that you can buy in, and they can be so tempting. They can be so so. Oh, I can save time. I can buy this one, and it's got all my resources. I just need to print them. I just need to move this. But actually, I love this idea. I think that word organic. Yeah. I think that is key. And actually, the thought and the mindset that that actually could be easier in the long run it's and more beneficial. It's, to a, it's actually just to sit back and see your environment for what it is, and to see, look at children and their families as the, the work in Reggio was very much the work of the families and the children being nurtured for who they are and their capabilities. Can you imagine a curriculum in the UK where that was nurtured to the same level of degree? What I worry about this approach though is it <laughs> it's a way of life, it's not an approach. It's a way to educate. It's a way and mindset to change all mindsets. I worry that this approach is going to become very much commercial and to believe that in the aesthetics of I can pick up this one environment and pick it up and put it into my setting. It takes a deep level of understanding of pedagogical documentation, the ways of recognising children's talents and individuality, but also talking to children and having them to work in partnership with you to deliver, to de to deliver the best possible curriculum per se. I think you've given a lot of food for thought today. <laughs> um, I'm definitely going to be going away and reading those books as yeah. well. Thank um, you very much. And thank you for joining me today. Make sure you go and join Rob's yeah. forum because it's absolutely so many things to think about. It's just it's nice to pause for thought on these big topics, you know, rather than just be thinking day in day out about the curriculum that I'm teaching, but that wider aspect. It's just really eye-opening and it really kind of confirms to me the reasons why I'm there with the children and why, you know, being an early years teacher is not just babysitting, it's not just playing with children, it's actually a much deeper 
the deeper level of understanding and actually it's to believe that we are professionals, we, we educate, we have knowledge that is far more and we should be talking to parents and guiding their thoughts and actually not being afraid to have those conversations and question always. I, I'm, I'm going to sort of give a shout out to my services here. James, thank you very much for allowing me to do this. Active Childhood Consultancy is launching in the, ne in the coming months where I will be looking to go into settings um, and offering offering consultation, meeting with managers, deputies, working with parents, devising personal plans at competitive rates um, to, to establish the best practice for, for also the parents but also in your settings. Challenging those awkward situations as well where there has been miscommunications in teams, working with teams on effective communication, working on staff wellbeing. Because at the end of the day, staff wellbeing is something that is so underutilised in practice that we are working long hours, it's draining, we've got issues, you know, too much as well as I. There are these issues occurring, but we don't often talk about them. This is an opportunity to meet with me on a one-to-one -one basis, to have these discussions and put a plan in action of how we can implement the best strategy for your setting uh, and obviously just I want to enable the power of reflection how and not being patronizing I, I, I want to be able to have these generic conversations and actually support you support your practice and enable us to become better and actually all settings for children need to be wonderful